So this is, you know, around where I am, my neighbourhood. Now, I looked where you were up and uh, it looks like that your nearest beach is two dr days drive from home. Um, um, just looking at it on, on the map. So um, so your situation will be different. You probably have more SOTA summits nearby. Um, but even your prairies, I thought, must be OK for transmitting, given how often I can hear WWV, which I understand is quite near where you are. So um, today I'll discuss antennas good for both, both coast and inland QRP. Uh, good news about all this is that you don't need very much. Um, a lot of people, I think, take too much when they operate portable QRP. You can get a lot of contacts if you take just a few well-chosen items. So what you see there is pretty typical if I'm out for two or three hours. I've just walked a few minutes from home and I'm about to set up near the beach. And every antenna idea I'll mention will be carryable by hand or bike. So you can put it in your backpack. Luckily, all are efficient enough, so you'll very rarely not make contacts. Now, you might not have much time to go very far from home, even going a, but even going a quarter mile from houses can drop your noise <coughs> more hugely. Like I'm talking about 10 decibels, maybe 20 dB, which means that you'll be able to hear so many more signals that you might not necessarily be able to hear from home, especially if they're also QRP. Uh, here, I'm near a swamp with a favourable long path takeoff to Europe. Now, I'm not going to talk much about equipment and batteries, but you do need to pick a happy medium. Uh, those Pixie transceiver kits you sometimes see online, the 7 megahertz crystal controlled, they're fun to build. And if you want a project that even if you get it wrong, then you won't have wasted too much money, then yep, they're good for the construction practice. But for reliable results, I'd give that a miss. Uh, crystal control is a big problem as you can't call people on their frequency. So you can be stuck if there's QRM that you can't get away from. At the other extreme, you probably don't want your big home station transceiver. It draws too much current and is too bulky. So you want to go for something in between those extremes of equipment. Um, the minimum, I think, would be a good single band five watt frequency agile CW and or SSB transceiver. You could get something like the Yaesu, um, FT818 or ICOM, IC705 or Elicraft transceiver. Maybe even a micro bit X, that Indian kit, if you're on a budget. Now, I've got no practical experience, but I'd be a bit cautious about some of those new USDX or micro SDX rigs. Um, at the very least, read the reviews before splashing out on your money. Some have been very critical. So um, yeah, don't have personal experience, but just be, be cautious. It might look too low price to be true uh, for a reliable transceiver. There's more on QRP equipment choices <coughs> on my website, vk3y.com. <coughs> now, as for batteries, I roughly allow one amp hour of battery capacity per hour. Although that depends on how much current your rig draws. For casual operating sessions, I go for something between three and eight amp hour. Even those three or four 18650 batteries to an LI FEPO four pack will do. They're fairly light, fairly small, and will give you a good operating time. A lot of it depends on the received current consumption of your transceiver. Excuse um, me, Peter. Uh, we're back on a slide that says what I do and hasn't changed. Uh, I wonder if we're looking at the wrong window. Um, yes, it, it is. I, I've got a slide showing on equipment and... Uh, once you clicked it, now we see it bigger. We still see the five pictures down the left, but this is adequate. Thank you. Okay, does that... Okay, is there another slide now? We're still on number five on the bottom left. Okay, um, I'm, um, it should now say types of HF portable antennas. You see equipment and batteries. 
Okay. Uh, I will Oops, now we, go back to. Um, maybe try going to the top and hitting where it says slideshow because I think we're seeing um, the view that you see when you're putting it together. Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm now on types of HF portable antennas. And yeah. we see that too. You see that. And um, hopefully that should be better now. So, um, yeah, overall with supportable antennas, really nothing to beat a wire antenna for HF for small and light. A lot of choices, which I'll talk about more later on, are like horizontal or vertical, mono or multiband, the place you feed it, the feed line itself, and whether you can compress its size. Or if you're really limited for space but can tolerate more weight, then a magnetic loop could be an option though there are some trade-offs. Now one can cover several HF bands and they can be suitable for HF pedestrian mobile. Now I've gone to another slide, um, which you should hopefully now- And we see, see antenna selection depends on purpose. That's good enough, thank yeah. you. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, okay, yep, yeah. as it says on the top, um, what antenna to choose depends on what you want to do for it. Uh, for closer in contacts on 80 and 40 metres, up to maybe 300 miles, you want an antenna with a lot of high angle radiation. Um, a half wavelength horizontal dipole or an NFED a few metres above the ground would be fine. But if you want to chase DX, then that sort of antenna won't be much good for you. Instead, you need one that has a low radiation angle to force the signal out to near the horizon because the lower the launch angle, the fewer hops around the world. And that means less loss, especially if you use caudal hop propagation where the signal is refracted in the ionosphere. So it doesn't bounce down to earth as much and there's less loss. So generally speaking though, the more height you've got, the easier it is to get low radiation angles. Uh, that certainly goes with horizontal dipoles if you've got a horizontal dipole up high, more than a half wavelength, then that can be a good low angle radiator. Um, a curious thing is that the two antennas on the diagram, and there's different antennas here, low horizontal dipole and a bobtail curtain, is both of these are actually about the same height above ground. On 14 megahertz, 15 feet high is low for a dipole. So if you want effective DX performance, it really needs to be double or more that height. 30, 45 feet would be good, at least a half wavelength. However, the antenna I'm comparing it with is called a bobtail curtain. That's three quarter wavelength verticals in a line, all made of wire with their tops joined by half wavelength of wire. So they're all in a line. Now, quarter wavelength on 14 megahertz is still only about 15 feet tall. Um, so it's no higher than the dipole, though you might lift the bottom off the ground by two or three feet. Um, but yeah, that will give you vastly better low angle performance, but isn't so good for high angles. If, if you look at the diagram, you can see that using the bobtail, it's all concentrated near the horizon, not so good for higher angles. Um, so something to point out is with the gain figures, that's not important unless you know the angle where the maximum gain is. No use having a high gain antenna if it's concentrated in the wrong direction at an unsuitable angle. So more on DX antennas later on. Um, for now though, there are certain antennas that I think you should avoid uh, for portable. Um, and, um, or at least if you do use them, be aware of their shortcomings. These antennas all have high inherent losses. You'll still get contacts, but the reports won't be so good. Um, so I'll give you a few rules, um, rules of thumb. First of all, it's hard to make an antenna that's much better than a half wave dipole, but very easy to make one that's inferior. Um, there's also no relation between cost and performance. In fact, expensive bought antennas may have compromises to cover multiple bands. Uh, I think you should also avoid dipoles shorter than about three eighths of a wavelength across the top, even if fed with tuned feeders. Though it's okay if you don't have 
very much horizontal room. If you've got a full size half wave dipole, it's okay to droop their ends down a bit. That's all right. But if you've got a really short antenna, then not so good. Uh, short end feds and verticals, I think, are almost useless, particularly over poor grounds. Um, you also don't want antennas with lots of parts to go missing, uh, especially if you're trying to pack up late at night. Um, antennas that claim small size, wide bandwidth, and high efficiency, that's all impossible. You can have two of those, but not three. Um, you also want to avoid antennas that are too heavy or complex, like traps or loading coils especially if you're using very thin poles to support them. They could also get caught up in trees if you're throwing it up into a tree. And also be wary of antennas that claim coverage of many bands, but without an antenna coupler. There's sure to be some compromises, even if it's just on the radiation patterns. Um, as far as portable antennas I've used, um, uh, I've quite a few. Um, if I had just one of them, and wanted a wide variety of contacts on several bands, I'd go for just an NFED half wavelength on a band like seven megahertz with an L match antenna coupler. Even that can work well on multiple bands. Like on 14 megahertz, it can work as an NFED inverted V if you feed it with just one tall pole in the middle. And that can actually give you a bit of radiation broadside, a bit of, little bit of gain. Um, a full wavelength delta loop is a good single band antenna. You can have a third of a wavelength per side. If you feed it a quarter wavelength from the apex, so you have it pointing up, um, feed a quarter wavelength from the top, so you're feeding it near the bottom, that gives you vertical polarization, which is very good over water. Another over water option is a vertical tied to a pier. It too can be multi band with the best performance on frequencies is over a range of bands where it's between about a quarter wavelength and five eighths of a wavelength. When you get too tall, then the radiation lobes split up um, and not so good. But you've got a range of bands where between a quarter and a five eighth of a wavelength, provided you can match it with an antenna coupler, then that can work very well. Um, you could just use a bit of wire and uh, just put along the tall pole that you can see in the picture. Um, a center-fed dipole, that's a reliable performer, highly efficient for one band, and you can get that same efficiency on a few more bands by splitting up sections to form a link dipole. Um, so you just have alligator clips that you clip on, onto wire. If you add traps and loading coils, I tend not to do that. That adds extra unwanted weight, um, especially if you're using a thin light pole to support it it droops and um, you don't get so much height. A tuned feeder dipole with open wire feed line, that is good, but strictly speaking requires a balanced antenna coupler. You can also make your own feed line out of hookup wire if you want to. I'll talk about a few other antenna choices later on. Um, for parks of the air antennas, um, again, depends on your style of operating. If you're operating from a national or state park for uh, parks of the air, you'll probably want an antenna that's not dependent on a good ground. You may also have to carry in supports, like people might not like you to be throwing wires up into trees. I don't know about rules up there. Um, but you want an antenna that's quick to erect and dismantle, also without bits to go missing, and ideally multi-bands. Um, so you've got a bit of a choice. Um, so overall, the best buys I would suggest, um, I've got them listed there. Uh, where I am, a lot of portable activity is on 40 metres. Uh, that's because where I am in VK3, a large proportion of our population is in the southeast of the state, you know, Sydney, Melbourne, areas in between, um, uh, within about 600 miles of me. But where you are, uh, from looking at the map, there seem to be a lot of hams in the Midwest. Texas and near the coasts, then 30, 20, even 17 metres might be better for you for those distances, especially during the day. So for that, a link dipole covering three or four bands is pretty good without needing an extra antenna coupler. Or you might want to consider a type of NFED, a half wavelength long on the lowest frequency and an L-match coupler can work for that. Um, antennas for summits of the air. 
uh, mostly similar to parks, but with the summits, you might be above the tree line. Um, weight might be more critical if you're hiking or climbing for a while. Again, you might need to bring your own mast and, you, and a self-supporting vertical might not be the best antenna, but that might be the only option. Uh, you might also be very time limited and only operating during the day. So again, you might have to compromise on performance. And if there's enough people, hopefully they'll be able to work you anyway and get the required number of contacts. Another thing to think about as you've got height, some great opportunities on VHF, UHF, even with an FM handheld. But overall, if you can, I'd suggest an NFED wire or link dipole and maybe a small beam for VHF, UHF for, uh, for summits of the year. Um, now, if you're near salt water, I'm not sure how relevant that is, but if you do have a beach holiday, um, say down to Florida, then or down to the Gulf, then if there's water in the favoured location, that can really help what call, people call the salt water linear amplifier. And you, you can work some great DX. Um, for that, for most benefit, I'd suggest some vertical antennas. Um, they can be loaded on the lower HF bands for the coil. Uh, there's a book by Les Moxon. Um, he wrote a book called HF Antennas for All Locations. Uh, it's an RSGB book, so uh, have a look at it. You, there was talk about Hamfest before, so have a look at books by G6XN, HF Antennas for All Locations. Definitely buy that book if you see it. Uh, a vertical dipole or loop would be okay as well. Um, but still, if you don't have all that, then uh, compromise locations, that can still be good. Um, uh, like if you're, you know, height is good, but even if you're out in the open on VHF, um, on the left, I'm not very meters, many meters above sea level, but you can still make some long distance contacts to the other side of the bay especially if there's other people on, on hills um, and there's no local obstructions. That's a really important thing, no local obstructions. Um, even if you don't have much height, you can still get good distances. On HF, um, a swamp, um, there I had to walk through a bit of mud to get there from, from my own home, but it was rewarding, worked a lot of DX. Where I am is oriented where there's a good takeoff towards Europe, long path in the afternoon, and um, there I've also got plenty of space for directional antennas. Like there I was using either a half square or a bobtail curtain, which is a bit directional, good low angle radiation. So that's good for DX on 20 meters and that can make a difference. Um, another thing you might want to think about operating in public. Um, yeah, um, some sites might not be all that far from home, you know, sometimes you can go to a remote place and there won't be other people. But if you don't have much, uh, and that can be really good, you know, the big benefit is less RF noise and listening there, if you haven't listened to HF from a remote location, then it's a real treat. The number of different stations you hear, often far more than at home. So definitely try it if you can. But if you don't have much time and you want to set up near a home, there might be some more passers by and that's good in a lot of ways there can be some more interesting conversations sometimes those conversations are more interesting than you make on the air um, you might have people whose <laughs> families are amateurs and um, might be interested in getting into amateur radio so you might want to carry a little card that tells you a little bit about you know where they can go to your website maybe the uh, ARRL for information uh, exams hamfest that sort of thing um, now, I've read about some hams having bad experiences when out in public, but that's very rare. I've, at least I've never had any problems, really. Um, some hams are just shy or unconfident. They wonder what others will think, so they never take their radio out of the house. Um, that's unfortunate. It's denying them a lot of operating opportunities. Um, in reality, most people passing are more concerned with their own lives uh, than some guy with an antenna. For me, operating public is a lot of fun and ham radio is just another thing you can do um, down the beach or outside. Um, I mentioned the DX before. Um, big requirements, maximum gain at low angles. Um, and I, I had the diagram up before where I showed a dipole versus a bobtail curtain. 
with the bobtail curtain being better for low angle DX, particularly at a location where I'm in a sort of a swamp like I am there. Um, a tall beam would also be very good for DX, not exactly portable. A vertical moxon can work. Um, it gives unidirectional gain, which can help if you've got interference coming off the back, but it's critically coupled. The spacing between the two wire elements, which are bent in on themselves, can be critical. So if the wire sags, then you might have a bit of a loss in performance. Phased verticals is another option, but it's a large number of radials and the coax for their delay sections can make them uh, neither quick to set up nor compact. So I've generally avoided those. Um, vertical or sloping Yagis might be okay for 21 or 28 megahertz, but you'll need a tall and often heavy pole for 14 megahertz. Um, even a horizontal dipole at 30 or more feet high, even that's not always easy to obtain when there's no tall trees. So the options diminish if you're thinking about a good low angle antenna for a band like 20 meters. The bobtail curtain is probably one of the best on a performance or simplicity basis, um, although it does need at least two poles if the wire sagging in the middle, maybe three, as it's three verticals separated by half wavelength each with the wires going across the top. Now, if that's too much, you can cut off one leg and make it a half square like you see in, um, in, in the picture. That's just one wavelength of wire um, 66 feet or 20 meters on 14 megahertz. Now that length might be familiar because it's also a half wavelength on seven megahertz. So you can use it on seven megahertz as well, uh, provided you've got a good antenna coupler as it will be a high impedance. Um, now the first quarter wavelength goes up from the antenna coupler that's down the bottom on the ground. Um, then it goes across by um, one uh, a half wavelength and then down another quarter wavelength. So it's a um, exactly one wavelength of wire, and that and ideally the ends would be about three feet above the ground. Um, basically, two vertical antennas gives you a broadside pattern with some good low angle radiation, like five or ten degrees. Um, it's high impedance as well, so you can't just feed it with coax down the bottom. Uh, at the end, so you will need an L match or coupler for the high impedance and a short counterpoise radial or mats made of kitchen foil. On the bottom of left of the screen, you can see what I've done with uh, some kitchen foil and I've got some plastic book covering over it to protect it and it can fold up. So that's what I use as a counterpoise. Um, a bit quicker to set up than just having radials. Overall, its performance isn't quite as good as a bobtail curtain, but it's still very good for DX. And I've worked a lot of Europeans um, on both CW and SSV QRP with this antenna. And we're talking about almost um, 14,000 miles long path. And it will work on other bands like 30 meters as well with this setup. Um, as far as materials for antennas, um, that's pretty important if you're operating portable because you want the antenna to be super light. So it's okay to use thin wire, provided you don't have loading coils or traps that would weigh it down. Um, so yeah, um, some of the materials, some of them you can find in, in your kitchen, like chip, kitchen chopping boards, uh, a good low loss material for antenna insulators. You can cut them up with a hacksaw. Um, generally, I tend to avoid coax cable as it can be bulky and heavy. Um, also antenna couplers, they can be too bulky and heavy. Bulky VSWR meters, especially if your transceiver has an SWR indicator in it. Um, people ask me, is that accurate enough? And the answer is normally yes. Just get it to you know lowest reading. You don't need to know the accurate VSWR. Um, heavy balance, again, I give them a miss. Only take the minimum, question every ounce. Does it add to your signal or not? If it doesn't add to your signal, leave it at home. Um, as far as supporting the antenna, um, if you've got trees, well, there's you could throw a line up into it, um, depending on where you are. Or mostly, as I do, I use a telescoping, or we call them squid poles here in Australia. Some places call them fishing poles, roach poles, crappy poles. Anyway, a fishing shop, you hopefully can get them. Um, my favorite is 30 feet. 
but there's ones that are down to 10 or 15 feet long. Now, even though the top sections on them are thin, they can still support light wire antenna, like the finest hookup wire you can have. Um, you, you know, if, if, radio, if you've still got a radio shack, you, you can probably get it on, on rolls there or order it online. Anyway, that is good for N-feds, dipoles and loops. Uh, a kite is another option. Um, it gives great results on bands like 160 metres, but you need a, a large space to uh, um, fly them in. So if you're just on your own, that can be awkward sometimes. Though there have been times when I've had kites that have been up for 30 or 40 minutes and they've been okay. Um, so a bit of fun. As far as matching the antenna, a uh, lot of people go on about resonant wire antennas and performance. Um, they'll say, oh, they, they won't use an antenna if it's not resonant. So they'll, they'll say that you won't get any you know, very good results. Um, in short, I, I found that not to be the case. You can use a wire that's 66 feet long and use it on bands like 30 meters. Um, even though it's not resonant there on 10 megahertz, it will still be fine, provided you've got a good antenna coupler. Um, and given all the bands that most of our transceivers have, um, capability on all of them or most of them is I think an advantage, especially with the improving HF conditions. Um, you might not have an antenna optimized on, on that band, but if there's propagation, it might be a band like 17 meters where you can get some good results there. Um, I tend to use a small L-match uh, antenna coupler, just a variable capacitor and an inductor that you can vary. Um, you know, just a tapped coil is okay. Even a toid on the back of rotary switch is, is good as well. Uh, some people use transformers for fixed impedance transformation. Um, yeah, that might work on some bands, but personally, I prefer you to be able to adjust the inductance and the capacitance. Um, I don't see the need for automatic antenna couplers. They you know, need a battery and that can be flat at the worst possible time. They also cost more than manual couplers and they don't add anything to your signal. Um, just as an example for the higher HF bands, 10 and six meters can be good, um, especially if you're, you've got summer coming up and these bands really open um, for sporadic E. Unfortunately, I've got the dimensions there in, in metric, but yeah, um, just a bit of wire that's a dipole on six meters with some ends to make it operate on 10 megahertz. So a simple link dipole, you can have it either horizontal or vertical, and that can work quite well. Um, and as far as um, another possibility for 10 and six meters, magnetic loop there. Um, the one you see at the top that can cover 21 through to 50 megahertz. Um, you don't, it's 50 ohm, you don't need an antenna coupler, but you do need to adjust the variable capacitor at the top. Um, it's great for pedestrian mobile, especially in the summer. You know, signals are often very strong and you can have contacts of like a thousand miles, uh, very, very common uh, in the summer. When you've got good conditions on HF and you've got longer propagation, I've worked Europe on this antenna with five watts SSB on 28 megahertz. So it's uh, an antenna to consider. Um, another possibility is a vertical. Um, one there at the bottom that I call the wade tenor. It covers seven to 50 megahertz. It's 15 foot wire vertical. So it's a full quarter wavelength on 14 megahertz, but there's a loading coil on seven megahertz that I just switch in um, that's in the middle. Um, it's got an antenna couple at the base and there's also a cut down version, which doesn't have the loading coil, doesn't have an elaborate antenna coupler or antenna tuner, and that can work on 14 to 28 megahertz. So I've done some videos recently on that. Um, for VHF, UHF, if you're on tops of hills, um, that can work really well. Um, there I've just used TV rabbit's ears, that's horizontal, um, which is good for two meters and 70 centimeters SSB. It will actually, what I'm holding there is at a half wave dipole on two meters, but it will also work on 70 centimeters because it's a three half wavelength dipole. It's still low impedance, so it's okay for that. And that will work for SSB and whisper. 
uh, where they use horizontal polarization, you can also easily collapse it. Uh, another option on the bottom is an oblong loop. Um, it's got a little bit more gain than a dipole, horizontally polarized. You can just made it, make it out of wire and wooden doweling. And that, um, again, for SSB, you wouldn't use it on FM. It's the wrong polarization. But for SSB and RISPA, if you want something very small, light to take up to a hill, that will do quite well. And it's very compact. You can, uh, a good thing about it, compared with a beam antenna, a beam might be a bit heavier. If you're using a really thin fishing pole, it might not be easy to support a beam that's stable, um, even if it's only two or three elements. Whereas the oblong loop is quite narrow. It's only a sixth of a wavelength wide. It's very light. So that means if you've got a fishing pole, you can support it quite near the top and get a bit more height than if you had a beam. And that height might offset a little bit the lower gain of that antenna versus the beam. So it's super simple to make. Um, it's just you know, a bit of wire, you know, a one wavelength. And because it's an oblong loop, it gives you 50 ohm impedance at the bottom. Um, so that, that's so you don't need a, a four to one matching transformer or anything like that. Um, another option, if you, you do have a bit more, uh, a better mass, like that's a, a metal pole um, that I carried down to the local beach, uh, you can have, say, a four element beam. And that will give you quite a big increase in signal strengths over the dipole. You might double the distance or more. Um, if you might be able to work 100 miles, even with QRP SSB, maybe even 250 miles if conditions are good. Um, like if there's a inversion, which happens most often during the summer, um, tropospheric ducting can give you a bit of extra distance. So um, yeah, if you're really serious, then a beam is, is a good option as well. Um, another possibility you may or may not want to do, but I enjoy quite a bit, I've done some videos on it, is pedestrian mobile. So not only are you portable, you take your equipment and set up stationary, instead I'm making contacts when I'm walking along. A lot of benefits of that, you can experiment with antennas like the magnetic loop, a bit of a novelty factor, particularly on HF. Most people haven't worked a pedestrian mobile station. Um, again, you can get away from home and go to quieter locations. Um, you get even more interesting conversations where people see you carrying this loop, walking around. Also a good way to get out and about and get fit. So yeah, uh, HF pedestrian mobile can be a lot of fun. And particularly as the higher HF bands improve, you can get some good DX contacts. Um, the main choices with that magnetic loops, they can be different sizes. Um, that's probably the best. If you want to go pedestrian mobile in your neighborhood, that's probably the one I would suggest um, because it's ground independent. Um, being over salt water helps a bit, but if you don't have salt water, if you've just got land, it's still okay. Um, you can walk around without hitting it on power lines. You can null out local noise. A 90 centimeter loop like I'm carrying there is good for seven to 28 megahertz. If you don't want to build your own, you can buy one called the Alex loop. Um, they're quite expensive, um, but yep, that you know a lot of people use them. Or you can just make a loop out of either coax cable or aluminium um, strip like I did there. So um, uh, that, that can give you quite good results or more for me, if I'm near salt water, the vertical antenna I mentioned before, um, that can give you a good range of bands from 40 through to 10 meters with the loading coil, especially if you're standing in the water. Um, um, I, I've, I've done tests where I've gone, walked outside the water and gone into the water and I'm in ankle to knee deep water and being in the water is a much better results, much better signal reports because the water is in contact with a metal um, metal ring that I, I've just got um, around my ankles. So yeah, provided I'm standing in water, I can get some great results with that. Um, so to summarize with all this, um, with portable antennas, um, I think you should keep it, uh, there's a huge variety. I suggest keeping it light and simple. Try things like half squares and bobtail curtains um, for low angle DX. Um, if you want um, more closer in, then dipoles and then feds. 
both half wavelength can be quite good. Um, good news is that expensive is not always better. And there's some great opportunities coming up in the next few years with the improved HF conditions. Um, for further information on all this, um, there's my website, vk3ye.com. And my YouTube channel, I've got lots of videos. There's playlists on portable QRP and antennas. Also on Facebook, I'm at VK3YE Radio Books. Also some books. Um, I've got four books, probably most of interest. If you're getting started in ham radio, ham radio gets started. If you've got a licensed study class, then that's um, a beginner manual. Um, it's more the practical aspects of getting into ham radio. So it's not a, a, a tech or general study guide. You still need all that, but it's more the practical things like antennas, setting up the stations, how to actually make contacts. And this particular book is written for um, the United States conditions. So it's, um, um, so yeah, it's all research for, you know, mentions the FCC, ARRL, uh, what you can do with a technician general extra license. So uh, that book could be useful. You can get it either as a paperback or as an ebook on Amazon. Um, then there's QRP books, minimum QRP. That's more general operating manual for low power amateur radio, where I talk about equipment and antennas. Then for more detail of antennas, like some I've talked about today, there's two antenna books, hand carried QRP antennas. So um, yeah, there's... Um, uh, and they've been very popular books. Have a look on Amazon. A lot of people have reviewed them. So, um, yeah, if you're interested in um, QRP and uh, that sort of thing, then uh, uh, look them up. Anyway, that's um, um, all I've got, but I'm happy to uh, stick around for any questions. So I'll, uh, I'll just finish the sharing right. and uh, hopefully... Well, thank you very much, Peter. appreciate that. Great presentation. <clears throat> We, we have a few folks in our club that are big on QRP, <clears throat> uh, from field day to parks on the air, things like that. So they, I'm really shocked one of them's not on the uh, in the meeting tonight because I know he's uh, big into QRP. So Ramon, Ramon was really big on QRP. He actually had his QRP unit with him uh, during field day. Okay, Mike's way there a little bit, David. Yeah. yeah. No. No. What I was saying was, uh, Ramon is really big on QRP, and yep. he had it with him uh, during field day. Yep. He loves his QRP. <clears throat> so, you know, I found it very interesting, and, and I think you know we have you have a, a kind of a uh, advantage being near saltwater, but yet we have kind of an advantage being high altitude. So, you know, you know the average height around here is you know, Denver's the mile high city. So, you know, we, and we have some 14ers that people go mm -hmm. climb on occasion. So, uh, you know, we, we have that benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish we had saltwater to go with it and then we'd be a twofer and we'd be like hitting all over the world for DX. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, we don't. Our water is uh, nice snow, fresh, clean, no salt water. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, I can see how saltwater helps and, and all that. Yeah, Chuck, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I just wondered, uh, Peter, on that bobtail curtain, which uh, I know what it is, but it's not the most popular thing around here. I bet a lot of people don't even know what it is, but uh, there's multiple ways to feed that. Do you feed yours at the top or the bottom? Yeah, I, I should have. Um, yeah, thanks for that. I should have mentioned that. Um, if you uh, just if you want to feed it with coaxial cable um, and you don't want to use an antenna tuner, then you can tune, uh, you can feed it in the um near the top i think it's i'm just trying to think it might either be in the top one of the corners or in the top near the middle radiator um you could probably do both the, the, the corner one might skew the radiation pattern a little bit but the big benefit of that is that, that is low impedance so you can just feed your coax there the problem with that is that if you is that what to do with the coax cable because if you've got the coax cable uh, coming out from it then you're going to skew the radiation pattern you somehow need to bring the cable out at right angles to the wire um, and that can be awkward especially if you're portable you might need another support and so for that reason i think it's easier to feed it down at the bottom and it will be high impedance so you will need 
an antenna coupler, but you don't have the extra bulk of coax cable and you don't have the problem of working out what to do with the coaxial cable. So yeah, there's, um, um, my comments apply both for the bobtail curtain and also the half square, which was sort of similar, but basically half the width of a bobtail curtain. Again, you can feed it either in the corner or at the bottom and the bottom is a low impedance, uh, is a, the, the corner is a low impedance, the bottom is a high impedance and I prefer the bottom. There you go. All right, anybody else got questions for uh, Peter? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Uh, Peter, when you were uh, referring to swamps, which back east I used to love swamps, but uh, you're referring to a saltwater marsh, so saltwater swamp, or are you talking freshwater there? Well, the saltwater would be absolutely the best if you can, but the one that I'm at, uh, that I, you know, in, in the pictures, that that's actually fresh water. That's that's a bit inland, um, probably about um, half a mile inland from the beach. Because where I am, I'm lucky. I'm on a pretty narrow strip where I've got the the, the bay, the saltwater, a short walk one direction, and the swamp slightly inland. But you know, this is um, saltwater wetlands. But the benefit is that it's a little bit away from houses and the ground slopes slightly towards Europe long, you know, in, in the favoured direction and sloping ground can be a benefit as well. In fact, I didn't, didn't mention that you have potential benefits. Um, I, I mentioned Les Moxon's book before. Now, he talks about um, if you're on the side of a hill set up so that you are, you could have even a low horizontal dipole, you could set up on a hill that's facing your desired direction, whether it's long path or short path, you know, um, then you could get some amazing results. Like he was talking about working, you know, into Europe, or oh, sorry, into Australia with one watt of SSB on 20 meters. And that was on the side of a hill, making use of the sloping ground to focus to in ensure a low takeoff and caudal hot propagation. So. Even though you might not have salt water, if you've got hills and if you've got side of hills and even a low horizontal dipole, then there could be some benefits there with DX. Chuck sounds a lot like uh, heading up into uh, into uh, the soda areas with with the, the wetlands that, that occur up on the top there. So maybe I'd be able to get both. Thanks, Peter. And, and thank you for the presentation. It's very, very interesting. Hey, do you have any comments on hamstick dipoles? Um, now, a hamstick, is, I, I understand that. Is that a mobile, a helical mobile antenna that, that's just short? Um, so the dipole made of two of them, is that what it put on? Yeah, that's, um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, you are going to have a bit of a loss because it's less than full sized. However, um, it will be a narrow bandwidth, but if you are just operating on digital modes or CW, that's probably still okay. Um, it will be, you know, for a band like 10 meters or 15 meters or 20 meters, um, it would it would it'd be okay. The loss wouldn't be too much. There would be more of a loss on 40 and 80 meters, but if you're limited with space and that's all you can do, then yet you'll still probably make contacts, but you will have a, a bit of a loss. Um, and if it's a low and horizontal, then it might not be so good for DX. If it was vertical over salt water, then it, it might, you know, it could still do quite well. Well, I don't do hiking, but I do take my car up to 9,000 feet here in the Colorado Rockies. I got a mountain behind me and a mountain to the north and the south and an opening to the east. And uh, in 2016, I worked, uh, uh, personally, I worked 700 stations from up there over the year. Mm. And the hamstick yeah, was up um, 16 yeah. feet. Mm. Yeah, no, you can, you know, I've heard of people here that have parked over salt water and just with a vertical have done very well. Another possibility, if you can, you know, some people take their mobile antenna off their mobile mounts and just get a full wavelength or a quarter wavelength of wire and attach that to their 
mobile mounts and if it depends on like if you're able to mount a, a, a pole and have that pole supporting the wire um, depends on you know how rocky the ground is and whether you can support that pole that is a another possibility so um, that could give you you know possibly better results with a full-sized antenna thank you Anybody else got any questions, comments? Yeah, go ahead. I just give a encouragement on POTA. If you've never been on the receiving end of a pile up, it's your opportunity to get one. It's it's amazing. You just sort of sit there and your jaw drops when you a dozen people calling you at the same time. There's people, I think in the US, maybe worldwide, that uh that's what they do. They go to the POTA site and find out who's uh at the parks and they go searching out those guys. So you have far better success calling CQ POTA than you do just CQ, I'm in my basement calling. Uh, mm. so it's a lot of fun. Uh, I, yeah, I have a question, Peter. You mentioned um, the, uh, like the, the small transceivers. I assume you're referring to the, the um, like those SDR transceivers you can buy on Amazon, that sort of thing. Is that what you were talking about? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it, I mean, it, I, I've exactly. got one of those. In fact, my first, a, first HF contact was using that uh, because I, living in an HOA controlled area, I wasn't sure how well this whole amateur radio thing was going to work. So I put a not very good dipole up in the attic and was able to make a few contacts with it. But I toyed with the idea of driving it up to the top of Mount Evans here, which is a 14,000 foot mountain, and uh, should be able to make some really good contacts from there. Um, and I've also thought about, as somebody else mentioned, using a ham stick. But what power do you normally run when you're doing QRP? Uh, normally, it's um, usually I start off with you know with five watts, which is what my FT817 gives you. But there's a lot of times when if signals are really good, you, you can, you can uh, go down to even lower amounts of power. Like there's a recording. Um, I've got a. Uh, I had a contact with G4AKC, who was portable, and I think we went down to certainly 100 milliwatts, and he might have, uh, uh, I might have been able to hear him when he was down around 20 milliwatts. So when you've got a good path between you, um, even with simple antennas like the bobtail curtain, um, you know, you can, you can go down to much less than five watts. Um, I've had contacts on... HF, even during a, a local field day contest where a few years ago I thought, well, what would happen if I could only restricted myself to low power? So I got an attenuator in and, um, it, you know, just a series of resistors and switches. And I thought, well, okay, we'll try 40 meters with 20 milliwatts. And with a contest, the it, it's a numbers game. So the great thing is you've got a lot of opportunities to be calling stations with 20 milliwatts. The chances are unlikely you know most calls that you make will fail but since you're making so many calls per hour then you never know some might hear you and in fact i did get a few contacts with 20 milliwatts of ssv on 40 meters and these were con distances like four or five hundred miles um so um yeah you can certainly have good dx results with milliwatts um you probably have to be, you know, a bit more operating skill. You have to, you know, the important thing is to keep yourself in the clear because if you're just running milliwatts and someone else is nearby on frequency or over the top or calling at the same time, then they are going to win. Um, but conditions can be good. Noise levels can be low, especially if you're making contacts to people on, um, on SOTA summits or POTA parks. If they've got very low noise level, you know, if, if they are calling and there's not too many other people, then if you're only running 100 milliwatts from home, then they might still hear you. So, yeah, you can definitely do things with milliwatts. Okay, thank you. Great. Lots of good information. Anybody got anything else? Questions? Well, Peter, again, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I know you potentially had something come up today and it canceled. So we got lucky on our part. So we appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, and um, um, hopefully one day we'll be able to hear you on the air and 
to be able to make contacts with folks here in Colorado. Um, I know my plan is the next time I get down to Florida is take my, my rig with me and try to make some contacts down there because I grew up in the panhandle of Florida. So I go down there on occasions and got to take my gear down there and hook it up and see what kind of contacts I can make and using salt water as a, as a wow. helper to, for the signal. So uh, it's always fun to see how that works. But again, thank you. Um, if you ever get to Longmont, look us up. Uh, come out and enjoy the uh, the mountains sometimes if you get a chance. It's beautiful out here. And uh, hopefully one day we'll get out to Australia as well, because I know that's on my bucket list to get out there. To yeah, that would be, it, it'd be good to see you here. Um, just a bit of a, a tip is that if anyone is interested in 10 metres, uh, a lot of VKs monitor 28.490. So... That is a popular frequency for VK amateurs. So um, for those into 10 meters and the most common times for 10 meters, as far as propagation to the US goes, is probably about, um, I'd say probably about two or three hours ago. Um, that time is probably when um, um, you're, you're most likely to get activity. Um, so that, that could be a useful hint. There's also what's called the, I, I'm not a big fan of DX nets. I prefer to make all my contacts independently, but if you are interested in nets, there's what is called the ANZA net, which stands for Australia, New Zealand, Africa. And that is on 14183. Um, now I'm not, it's on every day. I'm not sure if the time is the starting time, but I think it's probably starts in about three hours time, maybe maybe three or four hours time. Um, but I'm, I'm sure you'd be able to look it up. But 14183 upper sideband is the answer net. So that could be a way for those who haven't worked DX into VK before. Um, there's a possible opportunity there. Oh, cool. Well, thank you for that information. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chuck. Much appreciated and uh, good to have you all. And thanks for all the questions. And uh, I've, I've just got a link to my website in the chat and also on Facebook. I see that and we'll spread it around and uh, I might have to check out some of your books. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah. Uh, Jerry's still on mute. I, I have a quick question that yeah, just occurred question. to me and I hope this is real easy. Um, what What's the most common license for the people in the group in, in the club is it technician general extra what do maybe nobody knows the answer to it but what do I can, most you, members have Stuart actually if you give me about um two minutes I can look that up for you right now to be honest with okay you. I'm just curious what the you know what the percentage or, or ratios are yeah um that's a good question I, you know what I think the majority of our club is either technicians or generals okay to be honest um and as a and as a um, uh, let's see here, and we still have some advanced people too, so there's still some folks that are still hold that. And I I believe we might have a couple of novices as well. We do have quite a few MX extra still. Uh, I'd have to I have to run a full report, but I'm just kind of briefly looking. As a member of the club, you have an option to go look at the roster. And it actually tells you what class people have. Okay. And uh, where they're located. And believe it or not, I think. Yeah, I wasn't looking for an exact number. I was just looking for a ballpark. Yeah, I believe. This is, uh, general. It looks like possibly general. Okay. We yeah. do have quite a few amateur extras. Um, and we also have quite a few uh, advanced as well. There's still quite a few people still have their advanced ratings. And of course, we've got people that have that don't have the license class listed because they're new hams. So they're technicians or not even technicians yet that just join the club to kind of get excited about it. So sure. but we have do we do have quite a few technicians um, in our group, but yeah, it looks like about uh, 40, uh, maybe about 42, 43 technicians out of 175 people. Okay. So, you know, for me personally, I'm going to say a general um, right now. I, I have no needs for the extra parts of the bands right now yeah. until I can get a decent antenna up and stuff like that. Um, 
but that's just me personally. Jerry, did yeah. you get any other board members to sign up to run the net tomorrow night or the Thursday night? night? Um, actually, um, my bad. I didn't. Uh, I missed the net last Thursday. Did Dick take it? As far as I know, he did because I wasn't on. I was prepping to get surgery. I was. Yeah, I. Um, I don't know if Dick took it, but I haven't heard from anybody else. Okay. Well, keep on them because one of the things I told the board is they need to run the net for you. Okay, I'll keep I on. By example, I did it. I did it the first Thursday. You so. did it, and uh, Dick jumped on it, and uh, so I took him at his word and let him run it last week. I hope he ran it. I'm not sure you're going to hear any complaints. You know, otherwise we might hear complaints. So. No, I didn't hear any either. So. Yeah, I'll send out another email tomorrow and see if we can get any more to bite. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, because is the six meter net still active? I... Dick does it, but the problem with the six meter net is propagation. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, you know, if he doesn't hear anybody for the first fifteen minutes, he drops. Okay. Yeah, I've tried uh, it a few times, it. but I never hear anybody on there. Yeah, and that's the problem with six meters. You know, yet I think what we need to get him is a uh, Inves antenna for six meters, and then he might have more luck for local. Yeah. Um, I know there are some six meter repeaters around. Uh, not many, but there's a few. But um, I think what, what he's trying to do is more uh, DX on six meters, which is not going to get local folks on. Yeah. Um, he needs to really do like an Inves um, or hope that the propagation's to the point where it stays local. Uh, and I say that because I actually talked to a guy in Loveland one time on 40 meters for like 10 minutes. Uh, and I was like, okay, you're in Loveland, Colorado? Yeah. You're on seven dot whatever? Yeah. I'm like, all right, okay. Propagation is really messed up <laughs> because I shouldn't be talking to you, you know? Uh, or it's good, depending on how you look at it. And I was using a um, hamstick dipole. So... You know things like that. So I, a lot of it, I think, is just propagation, and and I know he's going to be probably playing more with his um, flagpole antenna once he gets it up, and it should be up here before too long as well. Um, I think he, in fact, that thought he might even have it up already, but I haven't heard. Okay. So I said it was still in the it was still on the website, but I didn't know if it was still active or not. As long as it's on the website, it should still be active unless he asks me to take it down or he takes it down. Okay. Um, that's the way I kind of look at things. Because if I don't know about it, it's still going to happen, you know. Right. So, um, anybody participate in the fox hunt last month or this month? Because I didn't hear much about the fox hunt either. I would have heard. Okay. Because I was actually at a um, an HF Hamlet class up in Fort Collins. Actually, it was Loveland for the uh, NCART group up there before my surgery. So, they had a bunch of antennas up there and talk the basics of HF and <clears throat> actually I told Joe uh, Lolly present up there so I'm gonna steal his presentation because that was great. They had like six antennas set up, some stations, people got a chance to get on the air really quick, uh, talked about common etiquette of HF. Like, you know, if you're on a frequency, see if anybody's on it before you go tuning. Otherwise you're gonna piss people off. You know, they're gonna hear the tone and stuff like that. You know, some just common stuff. Um, talked a little bit about CW. Um, you know, you know, things you do on VHF compared to HF, like you don't call CQ on UHF, VHF, uh, things like that. If you're looking for DX, you go CQ, DX, or if you're looking for a particular state, things like that. It was just some of the common etiquette. It was a really cool class. And I think I'm going to steal his presentation and um, do it for, for Lark uh, probably sometime next year, uh, maybe even right after field day or something, after winter field day. So. Your shack kind of looks like mine there, Stuart. Wires all over the place and stuff. All yeah, over Mike, you can probably see my oscilloscope over there on the bench. Yeah. I'm working on, I, I write magazine articles for Circuit Seller Magazine. Okay. In fact, I'm a columnist for them. I, after I retired, they asked me if I wanted to be a columnist. So I do a column for them every other cool. month. So I'm always doing, I'm right now working on one on barometric pressure sensors. And uh, so, yeah, I do columns for them. So, I'm, yeah, I've always got some project laying here for whatever the next article is. That yeah, looks like the labs I uh, I help support at AMD. So we've got yeah. a bunch of oscilloscopes there. So of course our our the 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 
same goal is still the same. It's just a different company now. So yeah, at least we're for Xilinx. So yeah, well, I worked at Seagate, but I retired in December. Oh, okay. Well, congratulations. I actually tried to get a job at Seagate, but apparently the position they had was put on hold or closed for some reason. Yeah. But, but we'll see what happens. I'm still, I'm still with AMD for right now, but we'll see what happens. But, all right. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining this evening. I appreciate it. It's good to see you. That at least 21 people show up at the beginning, which was better than last month's presentation. So I completely forgot last month. <laughs> I was planning to it. I just forgot. Hey, don't feel bad. Don't worry about it. I sent out the emails. That's all I can really do. And hopefully everybody gets them um, and things like that. But, uh, you know, we'll have more we'll have more presentations. We'll have more fun things to do. The club is, uh, you know, like I said, I'm trying to keep the club busy and uh, keep us active. Otherwise, we get stale and it gets boring and people just drop like flies. And I don't want that. So, but now once I get back to 100%, you're going to see more out of me because right now I'm still, I'm not 100% <laughs> at all. So, all right. Well, thanks everybody. Have a great Thank evening. You. Have a great weekend. Uh, if you get a chance, come out Saturday for breakfast. If not, we'll see you at some other event. Okay. Take care. Right. Be good. Night.